Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And can I say how delighted and honoured I am to be your first keynote speaker. Thank you very much indeed, Peter and Tim, for the introduction. Um, for me, this place is always the Naval College. Sorry, University of Greenwich. Um, but uh, it is the Naval College. And I was here 40 years ago. Uh, now, what you have not been told and you may not be aware of is that naval officers came to this place as the Naval College for their training in nuclear engineering. And in one building, this building, right underneath you, was a live nuclear reactor. <laughs> and the good citizens of Greenwich were largely unaware of the fact that in the midst of Greenwich was a live, throbbing nuclear reactor that actually worked and was used to train uh, engineers particularly, and people like myself who would take command of submarines in nuclear engineering. So it's, it's good to be back here. Before anyone asks, as a result of my contact with nuclear power systems in submarines, do I glow in the dark? Yes, but under circumstances I'm not prepared to share with this particular audience. <laughs> the um, second thing, uh, which uh, you may not, it's not in my biography in the uh, conference material, is uh, my family home is in Finland. And my wife is Finnish and we have two children who are uh, by, have both nationality, Finnish and UK nationality. But uh, I was back in Finland over the weekend as our house, our family home had been rented out and we were taking it back from the tenants who'd left. That's another story. Um, but as I went back to Finland, I was reminded, as I have been so often thought in that country, those of you who have not visited it do make an opportunity to do so. Because in sustainable development terms, every one of those 14, 17 international goals, Finland can put a tick in the box. If we want a national model for how do you tackle sustainable development, whether it's on sea, in the air, in the land, in your lakes, in your coasts, go to Finland, because they do it. And as well as that, they have things like gender equality in a way that we can't even dream about. They have a quality of life that is second to none. Is there anyone from Finland here? Shame. Anyone who's visited Finland? Few. Would you agree with that description of the country? It is a marvellous place. It's a model for sustainable development. And what, just one final fact before I get into the uh, bulk of uh, my talk, as it were. One uh, sort of pub quiz type question, fact about Finland. Finland has a marvellous system of educating its children. Right from the age of about six, eight months, they have these things called pivacotis, which can take children, it's what we would call preschool, and they are a marvellous model for actually getting children to interact with each other, learn social skills. The question for you is, they spend a lot of time outside. Can anyone guess, and I'll give them a drink, um, the lowest temperature at which they are allowed to take the children outside and play? Minus? 20. Minus? 20. Near. <laughs> Not quite. My drink is safe. <laughs> Anyone else like to improve on minus 20? Minus 15. No, it's in the middle. It's minus 18. <laughs> and you see these children, it's minus, anything down to minus 18, they're outside enjoying uh, the forests, enjoying the landscape, enjoying the environment that Finland can provide. But that's enough of Finland. Let's move on to why we're here. The value of our oceans and coasts. As has already been said by Tim, the, the degree of public interest in matters to do with the sea at the moment is at an all-time high. And we have Blue Planet to thank for that as being a catalyst. But there have been other things. It's been a growing uh, trend, I think, this, um, this growth of interest in matters marine and maritime. And uh, Blue Planet was probably just the final icing on the cake to really bring it to people's attention. Perhaps more significantly, uh, political interest in the sea is also at an all-time high. Now, I have worked in government in a variety of uh, roles, but I've never known the interest in matters marine being so high on the political agenda as it is at the moment. And we have secretaries of state talking about marine affairs in a way that five years ago just would not have happened. The Marine Management Organization is a part of DEFRA, uh, and within DEFRA, five years ago, the talk was all about farming, food, fisheries hardly got a mention, and marine never. That has changed. 
So there is an awareness both in the public and political spheres about the importance of the marine uh, environment that has never been before. But as Tim alluded to, is this a passing phase? Is it a wave that will actually disappear or will it last? I think all of us in this room would hope that it would last, but we'll need to, to uh, uh, see. Now, just a few personal reflections. Each one of us in this room has our own rationale and reason for being, as it were, in love with the sea and having an interest in marine affairs. Mine came, I suppose, from the fact that I've always had that sort of inherent love of the sea, whether it was uh, on holidays, and I suppose professionally, when I joined the Navy and was privileged enough to be in submarines, you saw aspects of the sea that perhaps very few other people see or experience. Uh, the thrill um, and the fear, I have to say, of taking a submarine under the Arctic ice cap and being able to experience at first hand the absolute stillness of the water under the Arctic ice is thrilling. The fact that you can, through upward-looking television cameras, see the undersurface of the ice in the Arctic, which is sadly now melting and diminishing, as we're all aware, is frightening, absolutely bloody terrifying, if you want to be honest. At the same time, it is so beautiful, and the shapes and the, the things you can see and experience from within a submarine are amazing. One of the things you, can, you can't see a lot, obviously, because you can't look out like Jules Verne, but you can hear. And the sounds of the sea are something, uh, unless you've actually heard them and experienced them, coming in, you can hear whales, you can hear shrimps, you can hear fish in a way that is really absolutely thrilling. So for me, my love of the sea, I think, came from experiencing it on the surface, where I tended to get seasick and it was all a bit unpleasant. <laughs> Dived underneath, which was absolutely fabulous, where it was peace and quiet and fascinating. Occasionally on the bottom, but we won't talk about that. Uh, and as a result, the opportunity to come and do this job in the Marine Management Organization was for me an absolute no-brainer. Uh, it brought me back into de dealing with the sea, and I can feel as passionately as any of you about the importance of the marine space. So let's move on, if this will work. Just a few comments about our oceans and coasts and the opportunity they pose to us. Let us never forget that we are an island nation. We have a maritime history and heritage which has been alluded to. And with Brexit, the dreaded B word, I'm afraid, has it come in once. It'll come in once more, but only that time. Um, with Brexit, we are going to be reverting to being a coastal island nation again. And the dependence of this nation on our seas is suddenly going to be back with us in a way that it hasn't been for about 50 to 100 years. The value of the sea, the global ocean economy, is set to double by 2030 at about 3 trillion. These are huge figures. And we have one of the largest marine spaces of any country in the world. We also have one of the most diverse coastlines around the shores of the UK, one of the most diverse and differing, with differing habitats, different activities of anywhere in the world. And especially so around England. With no disrespect to Scotland, the coastline of Scotland tends to be fairly uniform in the nature of the activities that go on there. But actually around the English coast, it's a hugely diverse set of activities. Our blue economy is one of the largest in the EU about 4.2% of GDP, and overall we've got a blue economy that we cannot afford to ignore. The opportunities for us as a nation are absolutely huge. Now, this just summarises, it's meant to be a snapshot of some of the activities that take place in our oceans at the moment. I won't go through them, but, and that's only a snapshot, and there are probably many, many more as well. The only point I would make out at this point is that from my experience, from what we see in the Marine Management Organization relating with many of these activities, is that the degree of collaboration and partnership between the various activities is more absent than it is prominent. We have a lot of unconnected activities going on in the sea. Now at this point, let me remind you of two or three features of the marine space that make it absolutely unique. Unlike land, 
No one owns a block of the sea. And everyone has a right to do what they want to a degree within a block of the sea in the way that you could not do on land. Point number one. Point number two, the sea environment is four-dimensional. You have what happens on the surface, you have what happens in the depth of the sea, you have what happens on the seabed, and increasingly you have now what happens underneath the seabed with mining activities. We have a four-dimensional, as it were, uh, um, context in which to deal with, in which nobody owns any one part of it, and as a result, inevitably, you're going to get a lot of people wanting to do the same, or wanting to do their activities in the same belt of water. And we have around England some of the most dense sets of activities anywhere in the world. Anywhere. When you look at all the fishing that's going on, when you look at all the shipping routes that's going on, add on wind farms, add on subsea cables, add on aggregate extraction, add on whatever you like, the activity in the marine space around England and the UK generally is absolutely enormous. Let's just have a quick look at money figures. Um, again, a snapshot of the kind of economic value that you can put on some of these activities. Fisheries, just short of a billion. Marine tourism, five billion. Numbers of people employed, half a million. Again, these are estimates but it gives you a sense of the scale of marine activities and the economic value that they can bring. But it's not only economic value they bring, they also bring non-monetary benefits as well, as we're all aware. And again, these are just some of the non-monetary aspects uh, associated with the activities in the seas around the country. Now, as has been already said, achieving sustainable development, and I'll come to what is sustainable development in a minute, uh, these are all the threats, and I think, Tim, you alluded to these in your introductory uh, slides as well, so I won't go through them, and you are all aware of every one of them uh, in many respects in much greater detail than I am. But these, if you like, are all the things that are making it difficult and challenging for us to achieve this goal of sustainable development. So what is the challenge of sustainable development? It's one of those phrases we trot out uh, and as though everybody understands exactly what it means. And I bet if I were to ask each of you to write down on a sheet of paper what do you understand by the term sustainable development, we'd probably have a whole range of different answers. However, I'm uh, tutored in this by the Chief Scientific Advisor to um, the MMO, Professor Selina Stead, and Selina is sitting there, over there, and she keeps me on the straight and narrow and reminds me always that sustainable development is underpinned by three pillars of consideration of the environment, econo economic benefits, and social benefits. And the challenge for all of us in trying to achieve sustainable development is how do we, how do you, how does one protect the environment, derive economic benefits in ways that also give rise to social benefits? And they are the three pillars, the three legs of uh, sustainable development. And I always like the model of a three-legged stool. If you take away one leg, you're left with a stool that might balance, but it's highly unstable. And real stability only comes when you get all three. And when I was thinking about this last night, thinking about what I might say to you and how I would present it, it occurred to me to go back to Finland. They really do protect the environment, get the economic benefits, and derive the social benefits as well. And I think that's what makes them unique as a nation. But I'm biased, so don't please, don't take it too seriously. But that is the challenge for all of us. Now, the Marine Management Organization, uh, just to give you a bit of history, was created uh, in 2009, 2010, by the Marine Coastal Access Act. And the architects of that act and the birth of the MMO recognized that you needed to bring together all the management decisions about what goes on in the seas around England and the United Kingdom into a single body. And that was the aim of the MMO, to be the focal point of decision making about what goes on in the seas. Hitherto, before that, it had been spread about a number of different agencies and across various parts of government. And sustainable de development has been at the heart of the MMO's business right from the word go. So it's not a new issue for us. It's central to our core purpose. We were set up in 2010. 
And our statement of purpose is we license, regulate and plan marine activities such that they are carried out in a sustainable way. If you were to ask me, do we really manage to do that for consideration of all three pillars, environment, economy and social, I would say probably we are less advanced on the social side than we are on the other two. But we can perhaps come back to that in questions. So just to give you a flavour, for those of you who may not know what the Marine Management Organisation is and does, I'm going to just quickly run through the key activities that we get up to. Firstly, to say we are a small organisation, we are only 300 people. About half of us are based in the head office in Newcastle, about the other half are based in 14 coastal offices around the coast of England. Our main work is to deal with England and the seas around England. Scotland has devolved responsibilities um, and does its own thing through an organisation called Marine Scotland. So we are an English body rather than a UK-wide body. What we do is we first of all plan how the seas will be managed and we produce marine plans of which are 25 year look ahead if you like as to how the various parts of the seas around England will uh, be managed in the future. We give permission for activities on, in and under the sea through our marine licensing. If you want to do anything in the sea you need a license I'm afraid and we are the only people who can grant you that license. We'll do it in an empathetic way and a sympathetic way and as quickly as we possibly can, but you need a licence. There are one or two exemptions, very few, I have to say, and we're trying to make it as fast as possible with a sort of self-service system, but I'll come back to that later. So we give permission for people to do things in the sea, whether it's fishing, whether it is building a power station, whether it's planting offshore wind, whether it's laying a subsea cable, whether it's building a jetty, or whether you want to dredge your harbour and dump the stuff at sea. You need a licence for it, and we are the body that gives you that licence. We will then make sure that the activities we have licensed, we will monitor them, we make sure that the activities are being done in accordance with the rules, the regulations, and any, any conditions we have made, uh, made on your licence. And if necessary, we will enforce, and if necessary, we will prosecute, and we do prosecute. And we have a steady drumbeat of prosecutions going through the courts where particularly, I'm afraid to say, fishermen have decided to buck the rules, uh, break the rules, we have found out, and then we will take them to court. But it's not just fishermen. A dredger, for example, was dredging Devonport Dockyard. Um, it had got permission to dump it in a particular area outside uh, in the open sea. Its navigation either went uh, clumsily off or it was uh, uh, deliberate, but it dumped it in the wrong place. That cost the master of the dredger £40,000 in the magistrate's court. So we do prosecute. Uh, obviously, we will try and educate, and uh, if we can avoid prosecution, we do so. But on the other hand, we do uh, feel it's necessary to go with prosecution. We also take act, uh, protect and improve the marine environment by bylaws, which I'll come on to. We also uh, give marine industries and communities, we are the mechanism by which EU monies and grants can be given out. And all of this is done increasingly in an engagement and partnership approach. I joined the MMO three and a half years ago, and I found an organisation that by and large was sitting on um, uh, a sort of typical regulator type thing, applying the rules and saying, no, you can do this, you can't do this, that's it, go away, et cetera, et cetera. I'm parodying it. But one of the things I have tried to do over the last three and a half years is say, no, we work in partnership with people, we work with people, we find a way through the conflicts that are preventing them doing their activity. Just a little bit more about marine planning, because marine plans are a critical feature of the future. These marine plans, and we're only halfway through producing them all, will, the aim is to balance the requirements and the needs of all the various sectors. We encourage cooperation, collaboration and coexistence. It comes back to this point. We often find you get people are wanting to do things in the same stretch of water. For example, we have fishermen off the Norfolk coast who are desperate to fish in the waters where there are wind farms. And wind farms, of course, have supply ships coming, and so you have an interaction between the fishermen and the activities of supporting a wind farm. How do those two work together? 
and how can we as the MMO help them work together in a way that they can both carry on their business rather than getting into confrontation and le legal challenges. The thing about marine planning is that if we have a good marine plan, it can actually shorten the license application process when you come to apply for a license to do something. Um, and we are developing a marine information system which is already available. All you have to do is to go onto any website uh, through, with any Wi-Fi and you can access the marine information system and it will give you a complete picture of what is happening in the seas around England. Now the plans we have at the moment are the East Marine Plan has been in force for about two years. The South Marine Plan literally is just being signed off by ministers and is coming into force. The other plans, the Southwest, the Northwest, the Northeast, and the Southeast, we are pursuing in parallel all together, and the aim is we will have them in place by 2020, slant 2021. Then, for the first time, we will have a complete set of marine plans covering the whole coast of England. And marine plans are laid down in law through the Marine and Coastal Access Act as any planning authority must take account of a marine plan when it exists. So the marine plans are becoming a very, very important part of the whole framework around which we manage our activities in the seas around England. We've deliberately gone for different plans for different areas to reflect the very strong diversity and difference between the various areas of the country. Um, some of you may have been engaged in the planning process. Uh, I would strongly advocate that you do get involved if you get the opportunity because it's only by engagement and input and advice that we can come up with a marine plan that is fit for purpose. Now one thing I must give a word of, word of caution at this stage, these marine plans are not spatial plans. They don't say this area is for wind farms, this area is for fishing, this area is for this. They are not spatial plans. What they do lay down is the different policies and interactions that must be observed when people are planning activities. Now, it is my personal view that I think once we've done the first set of plans, we'll then go into the next version and reiterate as well, we may well move into some form of spatial designation in the future. I think that is coming simply because the range of activities in the seas is going up, it's not going down, and the degree of coexistence that you can get voluntarily is limited. I think we will have to move into some form of spatial designation in the future. Some other European countries have already gone for spatial designation. We haven't as yet, uh, but please do not expect these plans at this stage to tell you exactly where you can do this or where you can't do that. So that's marine planning. Now, marine licensing, I'm not going to go through the whole process of marine licensing. Some of you will have been through the process. Some of you will have loved it. Some of you will have hated it. And I'm sure that you will come and wish to bash my ears about it and tell me what a ghastly process it was. We are trying to improve it. We are, de are improving it. The one message I give out to you is, if any of you or any of your organisations want to apply or need to apply for a marine licence, please get in touch with us early and go through this thing called a pre-app phase. A pre-app is like coming to talk to us, we'll take you through it informally and we can then identify whether or not there are any sticking points, any difficulties with your licence application. And we find that people who go through the pre-app and who then submit the formal application, we can get the formal application through quickly and with no problems. All the problems arise with the people who ignore that, say, oh, it's going to cost me money, I don't want to do that, I'll jump straight into the formal application. And it is a formal process, so once you jump into the formal application and then you find there's a sticking block or whatever, that's when things go uh, not as they should. So please, 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 get in touch with us early if you need a marine licence, even if you think you don't, but you're not sure, get in touch. Please, please, I plead you, I plead you. Because all the problems I, we have, and when they get up to my, my level, it's because someone's gone to a minister and said, oh, that blooming organisation, the MMO, it won't give me a blooming licence. And then the minister comes around and says, John, what the blooming hell are you doing? Nine times out of ten, if only they'd come and talk to us, we could, 
we could have at least identified that there was a problem, and then we could have started sorting it out. <laughs> and my message to the MMO people is, we are here to help. We're not just here to help, we can help and we will help. And we will get your license through and we will find a way through it. Because as you're all aware, the environmental re regulations are getting more and more tight, more and more strict, more and more difficult to uh, comply with. We have to be really imaginative and work in partnership to find a way through uh, and to find a way in which your license can be improved. So, that's enough on licensing. A lot of our work is on fisheries management, and as some of you may have been watching the television over the last few days, we've had just a minor little hiccup in the, with the French in the Bay de Seine with scallops. Um, and that's the kind of work we're doing on a day-by-day -day basis, managing those situations, advising the government, advising fishermen, and I'm delighted to hear in the news this morning that I think they've reached an agreement. Uh, because uh, otherwise it was really getting very nasty indeed. And those of you who saw the videos over the weekend of fishing vessels crashing into each other, and I can say as a seaman, that was blooming dangerous. Someone was going to get killed very quickly if that kind of activity had gone on. But what we do is we license fishing vessels to fish. We give them permission. We manage how much quota they can catch. We tell them you can catch so many tons of this or do so many days fishing. We monitor their activity 24-7. Every fishing vessel has a transponder. We have an ops room which has every fi fishing vessel, European and UK. We know exactly where every fishing vessel is 24 hours a day. And if they switch off that transponder because they want to go and do something a little bit suspect, we get an alarm and we immediately say, uh-uh, ah, ah, why have you switched it off? And they are, by law, required to have that transponder switched on. Um, if necessary, we will inspect at sea, and our 14 coastal offices, much of their work is around inspection of fish catches to make sure that the fishermen are complying with all the regulations. And if necessary, we will prosecute. Now, that for us is a big part of our work. Probably half the organisation is on managing fisheries, and after the Brexit happens, we are going to have an even bigger challenge in terms of managing fisheries, but we'll come, maybe come back to that later. Marine conservation, this is where we protect the environment. We have a duty to issue bylaws to protect certain parts of the environment. Uh, it's something we do only fairly rarely, and by chance I had to sign one only two days ago for a new area up here off Walney Island. And that's a new one that's just come in as of um, the last few days. Um, what this graph shows you, though, this picture, is all the various protected areas that exist around the coast of England. And it gives you a sense of how complex it is. Because all of these colours represent some form of a protected area, protected by some degree of legislation. Now, the general approach that this government has as a policy is that these protected areas are not, as it were, no-go zones, which no one can then do anything in. What we do is manage the activities that take place in them in order that we protect whatever the feature is that it wants to be protected. The kind of way we can do this is if someone wants, I don't know which this one is, I can't remember it off, but if someone wants to do fish in there or extract aggregate from the seabed, we may restrict the times of the year which they do the activity or the times they do it or the amount of material they can take out to protect whatever the species may be. And this is where early dialogue is essential so that we can talk these things through with you and get the right, best way forward. So that's what we do. We plan, we give permission, we monitor, we talk, we work in partnership. We're here, seriously, to work with everybody to get the best out of the seas in a way that ensures the economic activity can go on and the environment can be protected as far as we possibly can. Question is, is it enough? Given all the new and increasing asks and pressure on the marine environment, is the approach of the MMO, is that enough? Well, the government, to a degree, has uh, answered that question by adopting this uh, as part of its manifesto, that this will be the first generation to leave the natural environment in a better state than we found it. Now, this completely rules out and throws away the phrase protect the environment. 
It's no longer a question of protecting the environment. The government line is now we have to leave it in a better state. We have to enhance it. Now, the initial reaction of some people to this is, oh my goodness, anything we do in the sea, by and large, tends to damage, in some shape or form, some part of the environment. How on earth are we going to get permission to do anything if whatever we do damages a bit, and yet the government line is now, we have to enhance it? And there is undoubtedly that feeling amongst many people that this is actually an extremely challenging uh, remit to fulfill, particularly in our work of the MMO, in trying to encourage economic activity. I'm afraid it is a, f a feature of human behaviour that whenever we interact with the environment, we by and large tend to damage it in some shape or form. Equally, there's an interesting perspective of this. If we did nothing and just left the environment as it was, would it actually get any better? It might, but it might not. And you one can interpret this as actually a wake-up call and a challenge, because there are things we can do as businesses, as human beings, as organisations. There are things we can do to actively enhance an environment. The challenge of this is, can we now continue to do our economic activity and along with those economic activities, do activities that positively protect and not just protect, enhance the environment? There is one example that comes straight to my mind. And I think it was the port of Hull was doing a major development a number of years ago and was falling foul of the European regulations because it was destroying certain elements of a natural habitat, etc., etc. They then opted as well to do a massive environmental development away from the port, which actually enhanced the environment very significantly in that particular area. And when you looked at it in terms of what they were damaging as opposed to what they had created, the overall effect was they had improved the environment overall. And this is where we need to be moving into. All of you here want to improve the environment. I'm sure there's no one here who wants to, at the bottom of his heart, say, no, I'm out here to actually damage the environment. I'm sure all of us want to. What we've got to move into is a way, how can we find a way of doing it in a way that is possible? Now, the government has also issued the 25-year environment plan. Now, this is a very impress Im impressive and ambitious document over 25 years to leave the environment in a better state than it is at the moment. And it's full of the word improve. Improve on environmental protections, improve biodiversity, improve social justice, improve health and well-being, etc., etc., etc. But this is now government policy. And the idea that we are just here to protect the environment has gone. We are here to enhance the environment wherever we possibly can. And that's our job as the MMO, is to work with you to find out ways how we can actually do that in practice. I won't go through these, uh, but uh, these are the kind of things that the 25-year environment plan is looking at. Strategic approach, greater collaboration, shared ownership, blah, 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 all, all the good Yoho phrases that all, all academics trot out left, right and centre. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but what I want to spend my last few minutes just exploring is this one here. Two approaches which are now very much at the forefront of the government's approach to how we manage the environment. Net gain and natural capital. Now, a net gain, the idea is that we embed an environmental net gain principle for development. Put simply, at the end of a development where there may be economic gains and economic prosperity, can we say that overall there's been a net improvement in the environment? The example I gave you of the ports, uh, the port of uh, Hull the, a few minutes ago is an example of net gain. Massive enhancement of the environment over there. Yes, acknowledge a bit of damage here, but in, in net terms to the environment, the environment has benefited overall than if, if, it had just, if there hadn't been that improvement elsewhere. And we've got to take um, a more sort of global approach to what, how we measure net gain uh, rather than being fixated, as we tend to be at the moment, on one particular species that's being damaged, 
by an economic activity than saying, well, how do you protect that particular species? We've got to take a broader approach, uh, is my belief. Um, for those of you who are into the licensing, there is this technical term of activities that can be counted as mitigation and compensation. I don't want to get into it. The only thing I would give you a, um, uh, a word of warning about is that a lot of this is covered by the Habitats Regulation and by the European Court of Justice and the case law that the European Court has been uh, applying. The case law is getting even more restrictive than it has been in the past. And we are, we are finding that many license applications may have to go through a thing called a derogation route and an aeropi or um, a, a public interest test in order to get their license through. If anyone wants to come and talk to me about that afterwards, I'm happy to talk with them through about it. But net gain, we have to think about how can we do an economic activity and embed in that economic activity some kind of uh, something that will improve the environment such that overall we have a net gain rather than just a zero balance or a, even worse, a loss. The other tool that's being looked at is this idea of natural capital. Now, natural capital is can you put a figure, a sort of quasi-economic figure, on the value of the environment and its various aspects? Now, natural capital is not a new concept. It's been around for some time. Uh, there is a natural capital committee, uh, which is advising the government. Um, and one of the great benefits of a natural capital approach is that it encourages shared ownership through common vision. But at its heart, it's trying to identify the real value of the seas going beyond the economic picture. So Tim was referring, you can look at the seas through the lens of spiritualism or health, recreation, anything else, anything else. Natural capital is the vehicle by which you start doing that and start trying to put figures to it. Now this is incredibly difficult. Uh, natural capital, my I'm no expert, Ashling here, uh, from the MMO who runs Marine Pioneers. She is the expert. Please go to her. Uh, uh, Ashley, would you like to just sort of show yourself so everyone can see? <laughs> Seriously, if you want to understand where natural capital is, talk with Ashley. Um, but the point about natural capital is it's been used in the terrestrial environment and there are progresses being made there. The marine environment is much more challenging. And I'm told by the people who are the natural capital experts that actually making natural capital as a concept work in the marine space is going to be challenging and, and really uh, the academics are going to have PhD theses coming out their ears on this one. But uh, that's the tool we've got and that's the tool we need to work with. I just want to give you, a, a, just to explore natural capital a little bit more. It's an economic concept. It's sort of... You've got financial capital and manufactured capital and social capital and human capital and then natural capital is a much bigger concept which takes all these into account. And I'm going to shift forward to this marine pioneer which Ashling is leading which is one of the sort of test beds and we're doing some work in North Devon and in Suffolk looking at how can you adopt a natural capital approach. And this is a picture of the North Devon area and this is the sort of picture of the economic activity. I'm going to show you now in quick rapid succession six slides. This is if you look at all the assets put together. And you get a totally different picture of the area about the assets which might have some kind of natural capital value uh, assigned to them. If you look at just the habitats, you get a different picture. If you look at food, wild food, you get another picture. If you look at the natural hazard and regulation protection type environment, you get another picture. If you look at the carbon sequestration, I don't understand that phrase, but I'm sure Ashling can explain it. <laughs> but seriously, you get another picture. Tourism and nature watching, you get another picture. Now, every single one of these is building up the overall asset value of this particular area. And if we're going to make decisions about how we bring economic activities in there, we've got to do it on a basis of understanding what is the total value that we may be having an impact on. Clean water and sediments and so on and so forth. So finally, because I'm being told I have to wrap up and it's coffee time, you need coffee, I need coffee. But my final comments are this. We need to explore together 
net gain and natural capital as tools that help us come to decisions about how we manage the seas, what activities take place where, uh, and how we can both encourage economic prosperity, pr protect and enhance the environment, and derive social benefits. Net gain and natural capital, as I've indicated, they are new tools. They may not be successful. I don't know. It's too early to say yet. But they're the only tools we've got in town at the moment. They are the ones we're running with. And so I urge us all to work with them. Brexit, back to the dreaded B word. Brexit gives us opportunities for the future as we take back control, whatever that means, of our seas, and take back control of environmental legislation. The government has opportunities to put in place new regimes that actually allow us to make a living reality out of economic activity and also enhancing the environment. We need to continue and grow the marine pioneer, such as the ones Ashlings are leading. And we have to be in pioneers. Let's keep the word pioneer. Pioneers don't always work. In fact, in some respects, you learn an awful lot more from things that don't work rather than things that work immediately. The politicians, of course, want everything to work immediately. But actually, what we're trying to do is test out new concepts, new ideas, and not be afraid to say, well, that didn't work. Let's learn the lessons and try something new. And above all, and if I leave you with one message, my belief is that the way forward for all of us in managing the seas to get the best out of them and sustainable development in everything is we have to develop partnerships such as can be encouraged by meetings like this, such as interactions between me as a regulator and you as participants, NGOs, wherever you come from. We need to work in partnership. We cannot, we will not, and we will never achieve true sustainable development in the seas if we go on working as siloed organisations that occasionally bump into each other. Partnerships are absolutely crucial. And on that very strong note, thank you very much indeed for listening. I don't know whether we have any time for questions or not. Tim. Thank you very much.